A word is dead when it is said, some say. But I say, it just begins to live that day. And that is by Emily Dickens. Yeah, uh, you was right on the tip of your tongue, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to uh, Stories Rock, where we lift the words off the page and we breathe life into them. Um, tonight, we are presenting a program called uh, Kitchen Confidential. All of these stories are true personal stories that we share in front of a live audience. Um, and so I'm just delighted to welcome you. My name is Leah Ruckberg, and I'll be your host today. Elizabeth Bell loves to cook and to write. And to her, cooking and writing feel more alike than different. Both are about the process as much as product. And both take you on the journey within and get those creative juices flowing. And isn't that what life's all about? A little known fact about Lizzie, in 1970, you know, back in the days where you could smoke in restaurants, <laughs> Lizzie baked mostly breads for Hoosier Bill's Restaurant and Snake Sisters Cafe. Is that familiar? <laughs> Tonight, she will share my joy of cooking. Generally speaking, I much prefer cooking to eating. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being ah, 10 being ah, ooh, la, la. I give cooking a 9.8. Eating, on the other hand, gets a two or a three, unless it's my mom's sauerkraut. Thoughts of her sauerkraut start my mouth watering. Her secret, cook the kraut a long time in a low oven, and the whole house becomes imbued with the aroma of Pennsylvania Dutch sauerkraut. Since restaurants are all about eating, seldom do I eat out. And when I do, I ask the wait person to say the specials and desserts slowly so I can taste the words. <laughs> For tonight, we have blueberry pie and lemon meringue and cherry. Not too sweet, not too sour, just right. Or chocolate souffle with a drizzle of raspberry for tonight's Stories Rock, I'd like to cook you a meal, a Thanksgiving, the cookingest holiday of them all. Prepare to be seduced by food in the making. What shall it be? Baked ham? Roast beef? Both are beautiful and delicious, but boring to prepare. Well, except for Yorkshire pudding, rising out of the roast beef au jus, now there's a moment. My idea of heaven, at least one of them, stuffing a bird. Which bird, you ask? Well, duck is my favorite. I prefer making Peking duck than flying to Beijing. But stuffing a duck? No, thank you. Cavity too small, stuffing too rich, Turkey it is, big turkey with lots of room for stuffing. Well, whole truth be known, roast turkey comes spiced with a tad of vengeance. You see, once upon a time I had friends who worked a ranch in Sealy, Texas, and they raised pigs and cows and chickens and turkeys. And there was this one turkey, Top Tom, who took a liking to attacking me. He would see me walking, come a-running, take a leap into the air, and stick out his claws right at me. And the more he did it, the more scared I got, and the more he did it. <laughs> I confess, to this day, when I see a turkey on a platter, I think of Top Tom. <laughs> turkey it is. On to the stuffing. Will it be? Oyster's my drop-down favorite. It's a texture thing. How my mouth luxuriates 
rebels, when I, when it lands a rich, soft, creamy oyster steam to perfection here in the midst of a moist bread stuffing. Know the feeling? Chew, 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 swallow. <sighs> However, I find myself in the mood to prepare scalloped oysters. True, one can never have too many oysters cooked. I wouldn't want to be redundant. Too much of any good thing is too much. Hey, eh? what say we improvise, create as we go? Ready? Melt a stick of butter until its foam settles. Add chopped onion, celery, toss gently, and inhale. Lower the flame, the sweeter the aroma. Crush some sage, rosemary, and thyme in the palm of your hand. Sprinkle, stir, inhale deeply. Heaven come down. I find my taste buds begging for a fruity stuffing. Golden raisins and dried apricots soaked in a slightly rummy cider. Some Granny Smiths and Max cut not too small so they hold together and melt in the mouth like oysters. Some chopped parsley, salty pistachios, dried cube bread mix. Let's add some stock, mix the stuffing. Add some stock, not too dry, not too wet. Et voila, time to stuff the bird. Take off your rings, roll up your sleeves, and sink your fingers into the stuffing. Since neither me mom nor my aunt enjoyed the act of stuffing the bird, that got to be my game. I loved it. My hands loved it. Better than Play-Doh, clay, and mud pies. <laughs> After stuffing and trussing Top Tom, now, thanks to Richard Lund, I put the bird in the pan in the oven, downside up. Toward the end of the turkey's roasting time, I flip the bird over to brown the breast to make for a bigger feast for the eyes. Meanwhile, the dried corn's been soaking overnight and waiting and waiting. Though cream dried corn has never been a real favorite in the Thanksgiving feast, it does serve a necessary role. Like the snare drum in a jazz band, neither soloist nor star, necessary background. Dried corn takes us back in time to the beginning, the origin of Thanksgiving, when the pilgrims gave thanks to those native Wampanoag peoples who befriended them and helped them to survive. With every bite of cream dried corn, I'm humbled and given to remember our history and theirs. On to the pearled onions. Creamed or sweet and sour? I roll this question around in my mouth, gather the little pearls, place them in a pan still in their skins, cover them with water. The decision arrives. Surely, sweet and sour onions would compete with the fruity stuffing. Mom's creamed onions with a hint of sherry. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Time for the lowly potato. Me mom and her mother insisted on mashed. Smashed is the preference of the younger generation. For skins on potatoes taste much more earthy, right? However, Come to find out, there's more to the story than just taste. Seems the difference between stuffing and dressing, the choice of words, goes back to Victorian England. Stuffing was, too, was deemed unbecoming of a lady. Indecent, thus the birth of dressing. So too, I've come to believe the choice of smashed versus mashed, or Wonder Bread versus Whole Wheat, or Proper White versus Spotted or Freckled. I'm still wondering about smooth, velvety, jelly cranberry sauce versus lumpy. On to the scalloped oysters. I know there are many versions of scalloped oysters out there. I would love to host a scalloped oyster bake-off. I, myself, and my family rest firmly rooted in Fanny Farmer's recipe. One of the few instances I actually measure and read the recipe. Why, you ask? It's there in the second to last line, and I quote, Never, says Fanny, that's Fanny Farmer, anyone know another Fanny? Never, 
allow more than two layers of oysters for scalloped oysters. If three layers are used, the middle layer will be underdone while others are properly cooked. To me, this sounds like a lesson learned from experience. My mind's eye beholds Fanny Farmer's dinner table, an intimate dinner party, an iron white tablecloth, candles, folded napkins. The centerpiece, scalloped oysters. Three layers, maybe four layers thick. While serving, <gasps> Fanny Farmer discovers the top and bottom layers cooked to perfection, <laughs> middle layers <laughs> underdone. <laughs> or perhaps middle layer moist and juicy, top and bottom layers overdone. If you take away nothing else from this joy of cooking story, please remember, <coughs> Fanny says, never allow more than two layers of scalloped oysters. <laughs> Where am I? Oh, I almost forgot the green beans. I always almost forget the green beans. Why, you wanted? The decision is just too hard. Steamed green beans with roasted slivered onions, the healthy choice, or Green beans with Campbell's cream of mushroom soup and the amber marble red and white can topped with French fried onion rings. <laughs> I've been known to dream of these retro green beans. I even keep a can of French fried onion rings in my pantry, right there next to the six-year-old bag of Velveeta cheese. <laughs> Just in case I ever get the <laughs> I leave the great green bean decision to you and move on to the gravy. Mushroom, of course, sliced very thin, white, round, shiitake. Back in the day, making the gravy was a privilege to cook sometimes ever so quietly, fought over. The day when I was given the honor, I knew I'd come of age. These days, since all the other cooks are gone over the hill, when I make the gravy, I put myself in one of their aprons and proceed. Each had her preferences. Sometimes a little wine. Sometimes a lot. <laughs> Sometimes a little fresh orange juice. Beer. Cider. Always the giblets, unless, of course, they've been found their way into the stuffing. And always mushrooms. I say, time to take to the table. Tablecloth is iron, napkins folded, silverware, wine glasses, and plates laid out. Candles lit, <coughs> electric lights off, all is ready. Since cream dried corn was never optional, everyone gets a dish of it, placed where that salad would be. Next to arrive, the condiments, a dish of cranberry sauce, a dish of ketchup, for the scalloped oysters, of course. Here come the green beans, followed by the cream pearl onions with sherry and, ooh, a hint of nutmeg. The arrival of the scalloped oysters moves everyone to a profound silence. This often happens when you, give things, you save things for special. If a person had scalloped oysters once a week, even once a month, would they taste as good? I doubt it. To be the one chosen to carry the scalloped oysters to the table is an honor. For one can pretend that the profound silence is for the bringer rather than the brought. Smashed potatoes and mushroom gravy arrive together, since they go together and neither likes to get cold. Finally, at long last, that definitive moment. Enter stage right, our star, the stuffed bird. My family was of the carve the bird at the table breed. Part of the reason was the majesty of the moment. Why, I could almost hear trumpets. Another part was to slow us down. When the roast turkey arrives pre-carved, you can just dig in. When you gotta wait, you gotta wait. And waiting is good, allows those mouth juices to grow, you know. Here comes the surprise. Catches me every time. I'm full. I kid you not. Almost too full to eat. Like I said in the beginning of my little story, on a scale of 1 to 10, cooking gets a 9.8. I would rather cook than eat. And cooking is filling, even when you don't sample. In fact, there's seldom a real need to sample. This cook's mouth just knows. Ah, but the leftovers. Turkey sandwich with stuffing, lettuce, 
mayonnaise, cranberry sauce. <gasps> By then, I shall be hungry, so watch out. Mm -hmm. <laughs>